<clears throat> uh, try that again. Hi there, uh, I'm Bill Inman and I'm from Denver, Colorado and it's a real pleasure to uh, uh, talk with you tonight. Uh, I'm gonna do a little presentation on something that I, I hope to be interested in. It's a little bit different. It's not something that uh, uh, you find in our industry uh, very often. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. I want to talk with you today about using textual information uh, for the world of analytics. And so I don't know if you've ever looked around, but in most corporations, uh, there's a tremendous amount of textual information in the form of text. And some corporations have more, some corporations have less, but uh, everybody's got some. And what do we find is uh, <coughs> that textual information is difficult to, to grapple with. Uh, uh, there's simply too many documents for a, a human to read. And even if a human could read it, uh, to make any sense out of it. So uh, corporation after corporation has got this pile of documents that uh, they don't know what to, uh, to do with. Uh, so where are those documents? <coughs> Pardon me. Those documents are located in lots of places. Uh, important documents in call centers. Corporations have call center conversations uh, uh, and, and that produces a lot of information and text. They have medical records uh, that uh, medical records have got a lot of textual information in them. Corporate contracts, the internet, email, surveys, depositions, insurance claims, warranties, and many, many more places in the corporation. That's where text resides. Now, what are we doing with this text today in terms of making use of it in decision making uh, in the corporation? And the answer is we are doing nothing with this data. And I don't know if that strikes you as odd, but uh, there is a wealth of information tucked away uh, in the corporation in text that corporations simply ignore. And that is a shame because there's a very valuable in information in the corporation. So why is it that people ignore text? There's actually a lot of reasons why uh, people ignore text. Number one, language is complex. I don't know if you've ever uh, uh, taken a, a look at what it takes to, to understand the language, but you know we all take language for granted because we speak and read it. But when you stop and think about it, there are a million rules of language. There's the rules of uh, sound. There's the rules of words. There's the, 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 the rules of meaning of words, of how to put sentences together. And what's amazing is, is that our brain in the background processes all of these rules and we don't even think about it. But when you try to get the computer to process these rules, it's another story altogether. Text exists in many formats that uh, uh, there's all sorts of text that's out there. A, a lot of text doesn't have much business purpose at all. It's blather. Uh, when you ask your girlfriend out on a date for Saturday night, that doesn't have any real business value to it. Text is in different languages. Uh, there's, if I'm not mistaken, there's supposed to be 210 different languages on earth. Uh, there's nothing that's uniform about text. One person says something one way, another person says the same thing another way. Uh, database management systems do not handle text either well or at all. Yeah, like fucking children who are just like. Hello? I'm sorry, I heard somebody ask a question. Uh, sarcasm is hard to detect. Tone of voice is difficult to detect. Handwriting is hard to work with different fonts cause problems. And this is just the, the beginning of the list why text is so difficult to deal with. No wonder then uh, that trying to make any sense of text has been a real challenge. So what do we find? We find that on the one hand, text is very challenging. On the other hand, there's a lot of gold to be found when we go in to look at our text. So how do we get to where the gold fields are. Uh, there's gold in California, if we can just get to it, 
There's gold in text if we could just get to it. So let's talk about where some of this gold is. Number one, let's talk about medical records. Medical records are in the form of text. Uh, you, if you've ever taken a look at what a doctor writes down, a doctor makes notes about your meeting with the doctor and the doctor uh, says everything, it's in the form of text. That's good for one patient and one doctor, but it's not good for 100,000 patients all at once. And so uh, do we ever need to look at 100,000 patients all at once? Well, let me tell you something. In the day and age of pandemics, COVID and other things, that's exactly what we need to do, that we need to be able to look at 100,000 medical records all at once uh, 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 and we're unable to, are not easily able to, because the text in the medical record is, is, is in the form of text. So that's one place where uh, uh, the world is missing the boat. Another place is call center conversations that uh, corporation after corporation have these wonderful things called call centers uh, in which some representative of the company uh, make some kind of communication with the customer. Now that communication is, is very valuable information. That's what your customer is saying. And uh, when we take a look at this, all of the call center conversations are in the form of language. And what do corporations do with their call center, corporate, uh, call center conversations? They throw them away. And this is, this is like taking dollar bills and burning dollar bills. You can do that if you want, but you need to be a rich person if you do it. And yet that's exactly what corporations are doing. Why? Because it's in the form of text. Another interesting place where there's a lot of very valuable text is the internet and email. Uh, why? Because if you go out and look on the internet, uh, people discuss products and companies all the time. The discussions are in the form of text and it's available to anyone. And what do corporations do? Nothing. They don't take a look at uh, uh, even what people are saying about their company or their products. And this is just the tip of the tip of the iceberg, that there is a wealth of information in the corporation uh, that nobody is even touching. And that's a shame because uh, uh, we should be able to do something better about that. You know, the other day I had a college student ask me, uh, I'm starting my career, where should I go look for opportunity? And I told the college student, I said, you can certainly go into the classical IT organization and you can get a job there. But if you want to find out where the opportunity is, go look in the form of text. Because once you start to be able to unlock the secrets that are found in text, you're going to be an extremely valuable person to your corporation. You're going to end up being a vice president of the corporation rather than a database administrator. So another place where we, uh, th this one's kind of funny because when we first started out, uh, I stood in front of groups of ex executives and said to the executives, uh, uh, how many people in here know what is in your corporate contracts? And to this date, not one executive has ever raised their hand and say, we know what's in, your, in our corporate contracts. And I tell people, I said that, I find that to be really kind of funny because you guys are executives, right? Oh yeah, we're executives. And you're in charge of understanding your corporate's liability. Uh, oh yeah, we understand liability. That's what we were paid for. Well, I'm curious, how can you tell me with a straight face that you understand your corporate liability and you don't know what's in your corporate contracts? Don't you think that there's liability in your corporate contracts? And that's a stupid question because of course, there's liability in your corporate contracts, but executives have no idea. And then you ask executives, well, why don't you understand what's in your corporate contracts? And you get all of the excuses. He says, well, Bill, we've got 10 million of them. They're too many. Or Bill, we've run our company for, uh, uh, for 50 years and we've never understood what's in our corporate contract. And you get every stupid answer you can think of. Uh, executives ought to understand what's in their corporate contracts, if they want to call themselves 
and executive of the corporation. So those are just some ideas about the uh, valuable information that's tied up in the form of text. And we can go on. I'm going to tell you, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, uh, warranty claim information, insurance claim information, survey information. The list goes on and on and on. And what are corporations doing with information? The answer is they're not doing a thing with this information. They're doing zero with it. And this is why there is tremendous opportunity in unlocking text in the corporation. So you say, well, gee, Bill, I, I, I thought that there was a way to unlock text. I, I studied some things in school. Well, let me tell you something. I'm an old guy and I studied some things in school. There's something called NLP, natural language processing. And that's the way the world has been trying to process text for a long time. Now, there's nothing wrong with NLP. If what you want to do is to study language, NLP is very good for that. But NLP was never a commercial product. NLP was never designed to be able to uh, take text, uh, shake that text, and find out what's important to the text. And the, there's a lot of problems with NLP, uh, how much it costs and so forth. But the biggest problem with NLP is how, how long the approach takes. Uh, so a typical NLP approach is to model the business environment, customize the model, bring in a lot of expensive consultants, ingest the data, transform the data, uh, let the customer use the model to access data. And how long does this take? Well anywhere from six months to two years, or, and I've even heard uh, uh, cases it's taken as long as 10 years time to do. By the, by the time your executive spends 10 years in trying to make NLP work, they've forgotten what the questions were in the first place. And another little thing, NLP costs a lot of money. It's expensive to do NLP, expensive consultants, takes a lot of time. That's why NLP has not been a, a long-term approach towards uh, being able to manage text in the corporation. If you don't believe me, take a look on the internet sometime. It's something called the IBM Watson experience. Uh, I don't know if you know about IBM Watson. If you ever watch the, the Masters Golf Tournament, they used to advertise uh, IBM Watson. Another place where you may recognize IBM Watson from uh, was IBM uh, uh, Watson uh, played on Jeopardy. Uh, they played Ken Jennings uh, and Roger Craig on Jeopardy, uh, uh, and, and they beat Jennings. And let me tell you something. Any body or machine that can beat Ken Jennings and Roger Craig at Jeopardy has got to do something well. And there are certain things that IBM Watson did as well. But what IBM uh, did was they, they, they tried to turn Watson uh, uh, from a uh, an associative uh, recall machine into a business machine. And it's reputed that IBM spent over two billion, not million, two billion dollars on Watson before it was abandoned. IBM sold Watson uh, earlier this year uh, and gave up on, on Watson. And that's just one example of failure of NLP. That's the biggest one and the most obvious one, but uh, it's out there in public. And again, if you don't believe me, get on the internet and look up IBM Watson and see what you find. And so uh, that that was an NLP experience. And most corporations uh, don't have $2 billion to throw away. So uh, what's the problem with NLP? Well, NLP was designed to study language, not to be a commercial product. So if you want to study language, Man, NLP is what you want to do. If what you want to do is do analytic processing with your computer, NLP uh, is not a good choice unless you've got billions of dollars to spend uh, and three to four to five years to spend. And so uh, that's that's the problem. So, hey, Sorry, um, uh, who is it? Uh, Bob has a question for you. He's raising his sure, hand. Sure, Bob. So, uh, Bill, uh, I actually am a former um, uh, IBMer, 
and worked in that group uh, uh, in the uh, Watson area. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that machine was highly uh, optimized for the Jeopardy challenge. Yes. So you, you are correct. Will you be also addressing the semantic portion of, of text in your, in your discussion here tonight? Bob, you couldn't talk about text without addressing semantics. Or I put it like this. If you did try to uh, address text without talking about semantics, uh, you would be making a fool of yourself in public. The answer is absolutely yes, we're going to talk about that. Okay, I will be patient and, and listen, but I was just curious if you will be getting to that. So thank yes, you. I, I certainly will. Okay, so there is something new under the sun. At least it's new to most people. Uh, <laughs> it's just now coming to the marketplace. There's something called textual ETL. Uh, there is an alternative to NLP, and it is a commercial product. Uh, many people have said uh, what we've done with uh, textual ETL is to uh, create a commercialization of NLP. Now, it didn't happen quite that way, but, <coughs> excuse me, but, uh, 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 but, but for all practical purposes, that's what it is. So uh, if today uh, you want to uh, uh, go into the text in your corporation uh, and start to uh, make sense of it, uh, uh, there is a way to do it without going through the, uh, the torture that NLP puts you through. So let's now talk about textual ETL. Textual ETL is everything that NLP isn't. It's simple. It's not complex like NLP. It's inexpensive, not expensive like NLP and it's fast. Uh, it's not, uh, you can run it very, very quickly. I'm gonna show you some numbers in a few minutes that are, uh, are true numbers because we run it every day. Uh, NLP runs on the cloud or on premise. Uh, you can run it wherever you want to run it. So there is an alternative to, uh, uh, to NLP. It's called textual ETL. Uh, how long does it take to do an analytical project with NL, with textual ETL uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a corporation? Uh, we do this all the time. Uh, we typically do an analysis from the raw text to the visualization that you want in three to four hours. Not months, not days, not years, three to four hours. And, not, and I'm, I'm not pulling your leg, we do it all the time, just in case you're interested. So in order to process text, uh, we, here's where the semantics come in. Uh, we make extensive use of something called taxonomies and ontologies. And uh, now that's not all there is to doing uh, textual analytics, but a big part of textual analytics is, uh, uh, is, is semantics. And this is where it comes into uh, taxonomies and ontologies. Uh, we have available to us a, a library, uh, the world's largest library of semantics. We have 75,000 uh, commercial grade uh, taxonomies uh, uh, that are available. Uh, we have a library uh, that's been put together over the years and it co covers a wide variety of topics. But what that means is, is that we can immediately go into almost any environment that you can think of uh, and start to make sense of their text. And that is something that is uh, 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 rather remarkable. Uh, uh, it's taken us a lot of work to build those taxonomies and ontologies, uh, but we have about 75,000. So you say, gee, Bill, uh, what do those tax... Now, do the taxonomies cover everything? No. They don't cover everything in the world, but they cover 99% of, of, of the waterfront. We have taxonomies for such things as medicine, oil and gas, transportation, airlines, retailing, banking and finance, insurance, manufacturing, entertainment, hospitality, restaurant chain, hotel chain, chemical engineering, aeronautical engineering, bus transportation, police and law enforcement, 
military, and many, many more. Uh, I'm not going to say that you can't find something that we don't have a taxonomy for, but I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have to really look for it. Uh, and what again, what this means is we can take one of our taxonomies, paste it on, and we have immediate expertise in the field that you want to uh, uh, work in and want to look at. And so that that's why I can look at you with a straight face and say, uh, we, we do these uh, <coughs> uh, analytical processing uh, uh, literally in a matter of hours. It doesn't take us uh, years and years of building these taxonomies. We already have them. So, uh, uh, <coughs> <laughs> In addition, uh, we have other forms of textual analytics. We have uh, uh, something called inline contextualization. <coughs> Let me go off onto a quick tangent here. Uh, how would you read a document and find your name? My name happens to be Bill Inman. So <coughs> how would you find it in a document? Well, the way a taxonomy finds it is, is to understand uh, the words that are there. But names, uh, first names and last names, especially last names, can be anything. And so, <coughs> pardon me, you've got to adopt other techniques for understanding names. And we have something called inline contextualization. And one of the ways that in inline contextualization works, pardon me, <coughs> <clears throat> I'm just getting over COVID, so so please, uh, uh, my apologies. Uh, so, uh, uh, how do you do name recognition? Well, one way to do a name recognition is to identify a, a beginning delimiter, an ending delimiter, and gather everything in between. So, if I have a contract in front of me, uh, the undersigned Bill Inman does purchase the car. Etc. and so forth, <coughs> I tell the system uh, where to look for a beginning delimiter, where to look for an ending delimiter, uh, uh, and, and then pick up everything in between. Now, there's other ways to recognize names, uh, but, but ironically, names are one of the hardest part of doing textual disambiguation, which is what this is. Uh, we have a, a, a typical proof of concept that we do. And this is, this is what we do. We ask the client uh, what line of business they want to, uh, 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 to, to, to work in. And we have a nice conversation with the client and they say, aha, we are in pharmaceuticals. So we say, what form of pharmaceutical? And we try to narrow it down as best we can. That takes one to five minutes. We then go select the taxonomy that we have uh, for pharmaceuticals or that particular form of pharmaceuticals. Uh, uh, and we bring that into our environment and a certain amount of customization is required. Then comes the part that usually is the hardest part, the ingestion of the text. Text comes in lots of different forms uh, and it sometimes takes, sometimes the text is uh, nice and electronically formatted and it doesn't, we, this doesn't take any time at all. Other occasions, uh, you've got things on spreadsheets, you've got things in, in, in voice uh, transcription. Uh, uh, sometimes it, it's, it's a tussle uh, to ingest the text. How long does it take to process the text once we have the taxonomy and the uh, text in tow? Uh, typically four to 10 minutes, depending on the volume of data that we have to develop. Uh, once we've developed uh, the, the processing of the text, how long does it take to produce the database? Uh, typically five minutes, it's very quick. Uh, uh, and then if you want to do a knowledge graph or visualization, which a lot of people do, uh, that too is a mechanical act and it takes 10 minutes. Uh, typically a proof of concept is in the door by eight o'clock in the morning and is out the door by four o'clock in the afternoon. And these are real numbers. I'm not making these up. Uh, again, we've done this many, many times. And so what, what this means is now you can take your text and start to do things with it in your corporation. This unlocks the door. 
to all of those arenas that I was talking about, uh, healthcare, uh, um, uh, uh, retailing, uh, uh, listening to the voice of your customer, contracts, all of this can be done uh, as I'm describing it here. So what we do is we produce to you then a database uh, and we are uh, agnostic to the form of database that you want. Uh, if you want it in uh, Oracle, sounds good to us. You want it in SQL Server, no problem. Uh, you want it in DB2, not a big deal. Uh, you want it in Teradata, uh, not a problem. We produce your database for you and whatever you want. Then you can take your database uh, uh, and create your knowledge graph or your visualization. And again, this is a mechanical act that can be done very, very quickly. Uh, we work on, uh, 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 in case you're interested, uh, we work in the cloud or on premise. Uh, we do proof of concepts for free. You know, I have to tell you on this proof of concept, uh, people, when they first see this, don't believe it. They say, you can't really do that. And it says, oh, yes, we can do that. And we do it all the time. And so in order for people to uh, become a believer, uh, we show them. We take some of their, a random amount of their data, uh, take it, process them, and show them the results. So uh, we do proof of concepts all the time and have done them for uh, lots of organizations. Uh, we don't care what database management system you're working on. Typically, SQL Server, Oracle are the ones we see, but, uh, and I'm sure there's some database out there that we don't work on, but uh, Hadoop and things like that, uh, we're, we're happy to work in whatever environment you want to work in. Uh, what kind of output do you get? Uh, you get a simple database, uh, that's got your information. I might add that it doesn't have just your text. It also has the context. Uh, we recognize that if you're going to be doing uh, textual analytics, you've got to do text and context at the same time. That was the first thing uh, that we understood when we got into this business. Uh, once you've created your simple database, it's a very uh, simple matter to create knowledge graphs you can use Neo4j, uh, you can use TigerGraph, you can use whatever you want, or you can do a dashboard, you can use Tableau, you can use Click, you can use Power BI. All of those technologies work on the simple database that's created. Uh, we can uh, process any volume of data. Now you see a little asterisk there by any volume of data. Uh, uh, if you want to pr uh, process a huge amount of data, uh, you can do it in parallel. Uh, you, you'll need multiple versions uh, 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 of textual ETL, but it, we are agnostic to how much data you want to process. Uh, we can process any volume that you want as long as you're willing to parallelize it. Uh, languages. Uh, we operate right now in nine languages. We operate in English, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Italian, French, German, uh, uh, Dutch and uh, Arabic. Uh, uh, we don't operate right now <clears throat> in the Oriental languages, uh, and we don't operate in Cyrillic. But uh, uh, <clears throat> but we know that we can. And if somebody's got a project that they're uh, willing to, to to fund the the development work for that, we know how to go to multiple languages. Uh, uh, in addition to working with standard uh, text that you would find in the book are written properly, we also can operate on slang and comments, et cetera. Uh, uh, as far as going on the cloud, uh, we're compatible with Databricks, Snowflake, Azure, AWS, and anything else that you want. Uh, for now, uh, so, so those are some of the options. Now, uh, doing proof of concepts. We typically do proof of concepts for free, uh, but, but there's a proviso here. Uh, the proviso is uh, we only operate on a limited amount of data for a proof of concept. One time we told <clears throat> somebody that we, we do proof of concept for free uh, and they gave us several terabytes of data. And we said, well, uh, that's a little bit more than a proof of concept. That's the project. And we're going to have to charge you for that. But uh, as long as you have a, a representative and small number of documents, uh, we're happy to do it for you for free. 
Um, now, uh, let, let me back up one second. Uh, uh, when I say we do proof of concepts for free, that is assuming that we have the time to do it. Uh, we are recently getting to be overrun with business and uh, we may have to start to uh, either delay uh, how long it, it takes because of the number of people that are in line in front of you, or we may have to start charging that. But right now, uh, we still do proof of concept for free. Now, one of the interesting things about text analytic processing is the text analytic processing is an essential iterative process that uh, 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 that that the first time you see your results, I promise you, you're going to say, ah, now that I see that, I really meant this and I want to change it. And, 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 and that, that's absolutely normal for, for doing what we do. And one of the nice things about textual ETL, given the, 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 the very fast nature uh, that it runs in, you can do iterative processing. If you have to do NLP processing, if your iteration takes you six months to a year to do, you can't really do iterative processing. But if you can do an iteration of processing in a day's time, uh, then it becomes very easy to, uh, to uh, uh, support the need for iterative processing of text. And I'm gonna tell you right now, again, we've been doing this for a while. Uh, we've never seen uh, a textual analytics process a process uh, that hasn't involved iterative processing. That simply is the nature of the beast. And being able to do these things quickly is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the gives you the ability uh, to do it. Uh, so let's talk about uh, getting to where the gold is. We mentioned that there's gold in text and it's like going from the, uh, our, our pioneer forefathers uh, going from the East Coast to California. How did our, our pioneering forefathers get to California? Well, they got a covered wagon. They got some oxen and mule. They got the gun. They got some food. Uh, uh, they set off down one of the trails. And what did they find? Number one, it took a long time. Number two, there were a lot of obstacles to get from the East Coast to California to where the gold is. There were Indians. There was snow in the mountains in California, thirst in the desert, rattlesnakes, broken wagon wheels, rocky mountains, crossing rivers, and not all of the pioneers made it. A lot of them died along the way. So it took a year or more to get from the East Coast to get to the gold fields if they didn't die along the way. However, with textual ETL and you want to go from the East Coast to California, you get in a plane. And in today's modern world, uh, you get in that plane, it takes you a couple of hours to get to California. And by the time <clears throat> the settlers arrive on in their covered wagon, you've already found most of the gold. And so uh, that's what you're seeing is here. Uh, textual ETL is revolutionizing uh, the ability to get text in the corporation and do things with it. NLP is the equivalent of trying to cross the uh, the desert and the mountains uh, in a wagon train, textual ETL is going to the airport, getting into an airplane and arriving in San Jose or San Francisco uh, a few hours later. That's the difference between uh, the way we've been doing textual processing and what, what textual ETL does for you. So uh, we have, and so you say, okay, Bill, I, I, I'm interested, this sounds interesting. I'd like to know more. Uh, we have something you may be interested in. Uh, we have a free book. I say free. Everybody loves the word free. In fact, free is the only word I know that's uh, uh, known in every language on earth. It's known in Spanish. It's known in Chinese. Everybody understands free. Uh, the ebook is free. All you got to do is sign up for it. <clears throat> and you go to forestrimtech.com, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> look for ebook. And you'll find directions. And magically, uh, in a few hours, you'll have your free book. So we built a paint by the numbers book on how do you do uh, textual ETL. Uh, uh, we're giving it away for free. Anybody that wants it, no obligation. Uh, 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 it, it's yours. So that's a little bit about textual ETL. I I, I hope that uh, 
uh, for those of you that are considering career opportunities, uh, you look at uh, the world of text because that's where the gold is. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Thanks, Bill. That's awesome. Cool. Um, what questions does the audience have? You can type them out or you can... Uh... How long have you been building this library? Um, the library was started 30 years ago. <laughs> That's about where I would have guessed, okay. And uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, again, we, we, again, I'm sure that there's some things we don't have in the library, uh, but I think that uh, uh, probably for the world of commerce and what you're looking for, we probably cover 98% of anything you'd ever want to look at. And you said it's iterative. Does that mean if somebody gives you a bunch of documents that the odds are when you first get the results, you'd be like, oh, I want to change something or? Yes, that, Mary, that happens all the time. Or Doris, that happens all the time. In fact, I promise you it's going to happen. You, 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 you're going to, because doing this the first time, you're operating in a vacuum. You've never done it before. You don't, you don't know what to expect. And, and so uh, uh, so once you see what the results are, it says, ah, I, I need to redefine this. I need to change this. I, and, 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 and that's the nature of doing analytical processing. So then they give you feedback and say, change some configuration or something in the process or? The typical thing, not the only thing, but the typical thing is to say, uh, 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 to, to change how the uh, taxonomy interprets words. Now that's not the only thing, but that's the typical thing to say, uh, let, me, let, me, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, in the world of medicine, uh, medicines can have different names. We, we have uh, uh, medicines uh, called Lasix and Furosemide. Lasix and Furosemide are the same thing. It's just that one doctor calls them one thing, another doctor calls them another thing. So when you define your taxonomy, you're going to say, I want furosemide to be known as Lasix, which, by the way, we can do. We can do cross-translation uh, 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 of medicines. However, after you look at it, you say, oh, oh, I didn't want that. I really want Lasix to come out as furosemide. And so we go back in and say, aha. Now, when we read uh, Lasix, it's going to come out as furosemide, not Lasix. And, and, and making those kinds of uh, uh, changes, again, when you do text analytics, I, if you've never done it before, I promise you, you're going to be wanting to do it uh, all the time. That's the nature of doing it. Uh, Mary McCarthy asks, um... Uh, language and lingos are constantly changing. Uh, how do you keep the taxonomies up to date? Uh, we have a staff of people that that's what they do. Okay. Now, now the thing about language, language changes. And there's no question about it, but it doesn't change quickly or in mass. It, it changes incrementally and it changes slowly for the most part. Other questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, uh, something you find in data warehousing quite often is, um, uh, you know, you have this like companies acquiring companies and a whole lot of uh, normalization of uh, terms and everything like that, trying to get the uh, everything uh, coordinated, consolidated, um, that sort of thing. Have you applied the textual analytic? Uh, ETL um, to kind of try to reconcile what people are talking about when they're using different terms. Yes, we do that all the time. Uh, let me tell you one place where we do it. We do it in the world of medicine. Uh, uh, we were talking with the World Health Organization right now, and, and the World Health Organization says, gee, Bill, in England, they use one set of terms. In Germany, they use another set of terms. In Australia, they use another set of terms. And, and yet, when you try to do research, 
uh, it's very difficult to do research because people are talking about the same thing with different terminology. So we are able to define a standard terminology uh, for medicine uh, that, uh, 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 that, that you can say, okay, when somebody in England says, uh, uh, says, says one term, we can make it come out another term uh, to come out the standard term. So uh, that, that is a normal thing for us to do. Great, thanks. Sure. Now, there, there are other cases as well. Let me give you another case study. It's not quite the same, but uh, uh, one of the companies we're uh, currently working with is a very large oil company. And uh, they tell us that uh, uh, every well that they have has as many as 20 to 30,000 documents associated with that well. And they've got a lot of wells. And they say, right now we are overcome with all of the information we have. We can't find anything uh, in terms of who our contractors are, what type of pump we use, uh, what type of maintenance is being done. And so we need to, very simple. We need to be able to go into these 20 to 30,000 documents per well, make a database of them, and now be able to look into the database. And I'll tell you what it's like. It's like going into a public library and going to the card catalog. When you go to the public library, you don't walk into the stacks of books and start looking for a book because if you do, you're gonna be there in that library all day long and you may never find what you're looking for. Instead, the way you go into a library, you go into the card catalog, uh, you go to the card catalog, uh, find the information in the card catalog, uh, take that information uh, uh, and turn it into uh, a place to go look for your book. In an efficient fashion, you can find what you're looking for. And that's so that's what we're doing for this oil company. That's cool. Um, is, uh, is, is the technology open source? Open source. Uh, define what you mean by open source, because there's about eight different definitions of open source. Yeah, I think the, the, the question is, um, is it available, like, as, uh, is the code available for, um, to look at, to inspect, to... Um, to no, we don't, we, don't, we don't share our code with anybody, okay. uh, but we, we do make it very inexpensive to use. We operate on uh, uh, <clears throat> anybody's technology. Uh, we don't care whether it's uh, IBM or, or Honeywell or, or whatever else is out there. So we are agnostic to uh, the type of data uh, that we work on. Our only requirement is that the input coming into us be in the form of text. That's the only requirement that we have. Cool. Uh, you got we, it's taken a long time to develop our, uh, our, our, our code, and we don't share it with anybody. Got it. Thank you. Um, and you gang asks, I think I'm pronouncing your name right. I, I'm sorry if I'm not. Uh, uh, asks, um, can it find new trending taxonomies or topics? Uh, for example, new topics like COVID. Oh, sure. Oh, 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 yeah. We, in addition, in the background, I, we said we've been working on this for about 30 years. We also have, and it's not available to the, the public in general, but we have our own software for managing and building taxonomies. If we had to build these taxonomies by hand, we would never have gotten to where we're at today. So in the background is, 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 is technology and software for the uh, automated creation and maintenance of the taxonomies. And so when there's a need for something new like COVID, uh, it, it literally takes a matter of seconds to incorporated into our taxonomies. That's cool. I got a question for you. Um, what gave you the inspiration for um, textual ETL? I mean, you came up with the data warehouse, um, ETL, I mean, what? Well, what Joe, one, one day I was sitting around with nothing better to do. And I, and I said to myself, 
as great as data warehouse is, and I'm obviously a big fan of data warehouse, as I said, data warehouse only covers uh, a portion, even a fraction of the data in the corporation. The vast majority of the data in the corporation is in the form of text. And it was answered, and, and, and I asked myself the question, why? Why is it that computers don't deal with text? And, 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 and that was the inspiration. Now, if, if I would have known how long it was going to take and all of the travails I had to go through, I might have just uh, uh, gone off and played golf or something. But uh, uh, being a stubborn person, I, I, I said, gee, that's an interesting question. Why can't we use text in the corporation to, uh, uh, to, 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 to start to use it for decision-making purposes? And so that, that was the, the original question that was asked. It's really interesting. What were some of the surprises you had along the way? Oh man, oh man. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of surprises. One surprise I had along the way was the fact that when we first brought our technology uh, to a few people in the marketplace, that technicians hated our technology. I, I, I come from a, a, a background of tech, uh, technology, that's my background. And I thought, gee, we're gonna bring this out in the world and technicians are gonna re realize the value of what we have. Uh, and it was exactly the opposite. Technicians ran the other way as fast as they can. Of the people that understand the value of this is the business person. The doctors say, gee, I can now look at things that I've never been able to, uh, uh, to look at. Uh, the business person, the marketing person says, gee, now I can go out to the internet and find things. And uh, uh, so one surprise to me was the fact that uh, we were soundly rejected by uh, the technology people uh, and it was the business people that understood it more. And, and I, I find that surprising today. I don't know exactly why that is. I've got some ideas, but uh, uh, that's one thing that I found. Uh, uh, other surprises along the way. Uh, I had no idea how complex language is. Uh, when you stop and think about it, tucked away in the brain of every person that's on this call today, is this mountain of rules that you learned as an infant. There's the rules of sound. There's the rules of, of, of meaning. There's the rules of spelling. There's the rules of uh, sentence construction. There's the rules of punctuation. There's the rules of formulation. All of these rules are, are, are tucked away in our brain and we all process them automatically. We don't know that our brain is actually processing uh, uh, the uh, uh, the rules, but but it is, and and it's doing it right now, and 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 uh, being and having to overcome uh, now now, textual ETL doesn't address all of those rules. But we address some of them of the rules. Um, uh, uh, another thing that was surprising to me is <laughs> uh, 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 is is uh, uh, how. We have operated on a budget uh, 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 that that I've funded, and 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 when I when I take a look at IBM and IBM spending two billion dollars, and and uh, 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 I, I promise you we did not spend two billion dollars because if we had had to spend two billion dollars we wouldn't be here today. Uh, so we've done this uh, uh, much less expensively, which brings me to a little story about IBM about. Oh gosh, 15 years ago, uh, when we were first starting on this, I was doing a presentation in, in San Diego of all places. And at the end of the presentation, I uh, 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 had a gentleman come up to me and he was a vice president of somebody from IBM. And he says, oh, we, we too are working on a, a language in text. And, I, and, and he was friendly enough. And I said to him, and I said, gee, you know, we might want to we might want to collaborate and we could participate. And the guy said to me straight in my face, he says, Bill, you need to understand IBM is a big, rich, powerful corporation. We don't think you could add anything to what IBM is doing. And and uh, uh, and I'm going to tell you right now, I could have saved IBM two billion dollars. 
but maybe they don't. And, and furthermore, I could have given them a product that that actually worked, but they weren't interested in in talking to us. Uh, I've got another question. This is Mary again. Um, Bill, could you kind of put your sales hat on? Because, you know, companies are obviously bomb. You're, you're selling software. It's a software yeah. I, I love because I love text analytics. Most people, I think, don't because they haven't really been exposed to it. Um, but companies are bombarded with sales of all types of software, data in particular. Most companies are still struggling to get, say, the basic data warehouse infrastructure up, up and running. They're also hearing about ML and AI, this and that. How do you come in? And it's almost like coming in from left field to say, oh, but wait, you need text analytics. So what's the pushback you get and how do you respond to that when you're trying to sell this? Mary, I'm gonna tell you something that's gonna sound probably kind of strange, uh, but when we, um, uh, when we go talk with customers and clients, we normally politely ask the technicians to leave the room uh, uh, because we mm -hmm. talk to the business person and we talk in terms of business value, uh, number one. Number two, we know that what we're talking about is something that people have never done before and, and we, we know that. And so that's why we do proof of concepts quickly and for free because we know they're not gonna understand what we're doing until they see it in front of them, uh, 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 in, in front of them. And so in terms of number one, talking to the business person, number two, talking about business value, number three, be willing to show it, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, 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 and even then, a lot of people still think that they don't wanna do it. However, thank you, dear Lord, uh, there are people that do, business people that do get it. And uh, uh, so, uh, that's the sales approach that we use. How similar was that to back in the days when you, you came up with the, the original idea for the data warehouse and, and tried to sell that? Joe, uh, <laughs> it's almost exactly the same experience. I don't know if you know anything about the, uh, the origins of data warehouse, uh, but data warehouse was routinely uh, rejected by vendors and, and technicians. Uh, if it hadn't have been for the marketing departments of the world, Data Warehouse never would have existed because uh, when we first went out to the world and started to talk to them about the world of data warehousing, technicians ran the other direction. Uh, at the time, at the time, the notion of a database was a single source of data for all processing. And Data Warehouse came along and said, no, there needs to be one type of database for transaction processing and another type of database for analytical processing. And at the time, this was a very threatening to IBM uh, uh, and to a lot of corporations. And so the technicians of the world routinely rejected Data Warehouse. And so what we did was we started appealing to the marketing department. Um, the first company that ever adopted Data Warehouse was a company uh, called Pactel Cellular in San Diego, California. And God bless Pactel Cellular. I, I, uh, they're now part of uh, McCall Communications, and I, I don't follow who they are. But back in those days, uh, there was a war going on for market share in cell phone. This was in the early days of cell phone. And uh, Pactel Cellular found out that with a data warehouse, uh, they could start to take market share away from the other cellular companies. And so what happened was the other cellular companies came along and, and they went from the, the, the CEO down to the technician and says, uh, I hear Pactel Cellular's got a data warehouse. We have to have one. That's how data warehouse got sold. It didn't get sold because of its technical merit. It got sold because of uh, market share penetration. And once the cellular companies got uh, 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 to working, then along came Walmart, then came along uh, uh, the rest of the world. But uh, um, uh, it's exactly the same experience. For whatever reason, the technicians of the world are immune 
from new ideas and, and, and new opportunities. And I don't know why that is. Uh, 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 I don't know why that is, but, but I can tell you it is. And, and so that, that, that's why uh, we sell to the business person uh, and we're polite to the technician, uh, but we are routinely rejected by the technicians. That's interesting. <clears throat> Slightly related question, historically speaking, because you said this has basically taken you about 30 years to, to build up. That would be mid 90s when you were starting. Uh, yep. I started in the mid 90s. That was before like laptops were really prevalent. You couldn't, you certainly couldn't run like a big thing like this uh, on a laptop when if you existed in that space at the time. How how did you go about this? What what was the practicality there? Um, we started on a mainframe, and and, and I mean, I, I, when I think back about it. Uh, it's almost incredible to think that we did, but this the uh, the very 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 earliest rendition of this all started on the mainframe, and uh, that's that's because at that time that's all there was. Uh, there 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 wasn't no uh, personal computer or anything like that. At least not in the the enterprise or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Is it is it in C? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I know it's not related to text uh, ETL, but I'm sure everyone's wondering, what, what are your thoughts on the, the current state of the data warehouse in, in 2022? Well, um, uh, I uh, first off, do we still need a data warehouse? Let me tell you something. As long as we need believable, useful data in the corporation, we're going to need a data warehouse. Data warehouse is not something that we needed back in the uh, 1990s and don't need today. However, the form of the, the, the technology to support a data warehouse uh, uh, has, has changed significantly. Uh, for one thing, way back when, all we had was transaction uh, uh, type of data. Today, we've got transaction data, we've got textual data, we've got analog IoT data, uh, so we've got a lot of different forms of data uh, uh, today. Uh, another thing uh, that we have today is we have the cloud, and 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 and, and we have uh, the ability to do things in parallel, the ability to handle far more data than we ever could. So the technology of the world has changed significantly, but what hasn't changed is the need for believable data. And, and so I get asked the question all the time, when is data warehouse gonna go away? And the data warehouse is gonna go away when people no longer need data that they can uh, believe in and use. And, and, uh, and, when, and, and that's like saying, uh, when do humans not need air anymore? And the answer is humans aren't gonna need air when they're dead. I really like the notion of believable data. Um, we, we had a um, Bill and I had a good chat over the weekend, and he, he brought. I, I kind of asked him what his true north was, and he said it was you know throughout his career, and he said uh, believable data. And I was like, that's actually probably the um, I think the most succinct way of putting um, <laughs> what we're all trying to do here. So, yep, yeah, it's interesting. Hey, Bill, Another questions? No, oh, go ahead. Go yep. ahead. Hey Bill, this is Eric. Hey, question for you. So, when you're when you're engaging with the with a client, I, I would imagine you guys would typically like customize a taxonomy for the client, right? And then, does yep. the client does the client over time maintain the taxonomy themselves, or is that something you guys do? Okay. I mean, how does that we, work? We keep the generic taxonomies, so okay. that's that's our property, and we keep it. The client keeps their version and their customization of the taxonomy. And, and, and then when it comes to the, uh, the issue of how do they keep it up to date, uh, <coughs> they can either contract with us to keep it up to date or, or we can show them how to keep it up to date. But I'm gonna tell you right now, again, we have automated the process 
of building the taxonomies and 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 it, it's it's trivial to keep the taxonomy up to date it is not it is not a big task so so somebody says well can you do it for us we we say and we don't charge much we say yeah for a certain amount of money we can uh, 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 keep your taxonomy up to date or we can show you how to do it and you don't have to bother us but it's it's a on a scale of 1 to 10 it's a point five it's not even a one okay so most of your clients they maintain their own taxonomies and they and they process their own text over time too yeah. uh that sir is all over the map uh okay uh, 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 some companies want to do it one way other companies want to do it another way some companies have to do it on premise uh, other companies want to do it on the cloud uh, i mean i mean uh, as far as I'm, as far as I can tell you, there's no answer to that question. At least I don't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. Mary, you had a question? Yeah, um, sort of related to what I think Eric was saying, just talking about the, the clients and where you're getting the most interest for this. I'm, I'd be curious what industries, you mentioned that you have an oil company that's uh, a client. Where else do you get you know, are you getting sales basically? Um, the, the the basic place, Mary, where we're getting sales uh, uh, is right now we're working with one of the world's largest oil companies. Thank you, dear Lord. Uh, 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 we also uh, are working with uh, medical organizations. And so uh, medicine and, and, and sales uh, uh, and oil companies are where our biggest customer base is now. But, but, the truth is, is that everybody, um, um, everybody needs it. It's just a matter of introducing them to it. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll tell you the one that drives me crazy personally is corporate contracts. It, it, I've, I've talked to a lot of executives about corporate contracts. And again, I ask them the question, do you know what's in your corporate contracts? And nobody knows what's in their corporate contracts. And, 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 and I'll tell you what selling to corporate contracts is like. It's like selling caskets. It, 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 nobody buys a casket until they absolutely have to. And, 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 and I would rather sell caskets than I would sell corporate, uh, 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 corporate contracts. But uh, medicine, especially in the day and age of, of, of the pandemic uh, that we have, uh, uh, and then uh, oil companies that want to get a handle on what's going on in their corporation, uh, those people are good people to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. Um, is there any value or in like the first pass of like using a generic taxonomy on a document or, because I work for digital asset management software company. And so like we, get services, right, where we process, we ingest a lot of documents, more image related, but we do some text. And, you know, I could envision like an API where I'm like, here's my document, here's the taxonomy field that I, you know, oil and gas or whatever, give me something back. Is there value in that to somebody without having to do the, you know, iterate and make it customized for a particular customer? Uh, Doris is absolutely yes, but having stated that, and we've seen this over and over again, uh, 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 the minute somebody sees what can be done, they're going to want to change it and say, yeah, but I really want to change this, and I really want to add this, and I really want to look for this, and and so, uh, but, but, but yes, there's actually great value in doing that on a first pass, but you better be prepared for doing it iteratively. Okay. Bill, you hinted at some of the hidden gold in the start of your presentation. I was wondering if you've been able to follow up with some of your clients to uh, see where some of the discoveries that the textual ETL had, had made had really made a difference. Uh, um, it's the difference between having a huge library with no card catalog and the library with a real card catalog. And, and, and I'm going to tell you right now, 
and we take great pride in this. Every client we have loves us because they, 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 their eyes are open. Right now, people's eyes are, are closed because they don't know what can be done. But once they find out what can be done, then, they, then all of a sudden, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's like a kid discovering ice cream that if a kid has never had ice cream before, uh, they don't know what ice cream is, whatever, but one day they discover ice cream and suddenly they can't get enough. Um, thanks. Sure. I've got a question from Doug Tharp. Um, is legalese more standard than other language taxonomies? Um, uh, kind of gives an example, just like a jillion customer uh, service reps in non-US English. So he's thinking of contracts. Let me kind of answer that question a little bit indirectly. Um, um, easily the most involved and complex uh, uh, industry to get into is the world of medicine. L let me give you some quick, quick numbers that, that you may or may not know, uh, be aware of. How many words are in the English language? And nobody knows for sure, but they estimate there are about 660,000 words in the English language. Now, of those 660,000 words in the English language, how many of them are related to medicine? And it may surprise you to find out that 600,000 words are related to medicine. So uh, the taxonomies that we have for healthcare and medicine far outweigh anything else that's out there. Now, each profession, whether it's legal, whether it's accounting, whether it's medicine, uh, has their own vocabulary, but 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 uh, healthcare and medicine is is the the big big uh, it, it's the Rocky Mountains compared to the hill in your backyard. So uh, 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 yes, the, we do have legal uh, taxonomies, but but if you want to start to compare taxonomies by industry, nothing compares to healthcare. Healthcare is in a class by itself. In your book, um, uh, uh, Text Analytics Simplified, you do mention too that some, the, uh, the, the results of textual ETL can be used in machine learning. Do, do you want to maybe talk about that? <laughs> uh, that was one of the other authors of the book. And one of the, one of the advantages of writing the book with somebody is when somebody asks you a question, you can always claim the other author wrote it. Uh, uh, but I can I can introduce you to some of our our, our other authors, and sure. uh, uh, that's a little bit out of my line of work. Okay, cool. Yeah, it caught my attention though because it it seems like this actually sets up the the data prep for uh, probably machine learning applications too, which you know oh. text it's, it's you, know, you know you know I see these people talk about AI all the time, and I actually am a big fan of AI. But I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, uh, being able to, to grapple and, and take text and do what we do to text is a foundation for AI. I honestly don't know how you can do a lot of AI without going into uh, uh, text. So uh, the way I look at it is we provide the foundation and then things like uh, ML and AI uh, operate on the foundation that we provide. That's how I look at it. Yeah, it seems like a any other questions? I have a slightly more meta one. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Whoever that was. I, I talk enough. Okay. This is Eric again. So, Bill, I work at a large uh, bank that has consumer. I, I work on phone shop data for, for a large U.S. bank. Um, that's mainly consumer, but also small business sort of customers, right? Mm -hmm. And we have and we have text transcripts of all the phone calls, right? And we can see what what our team members said on the call and what the customer said or the other counterparty person on the call said. Mm -hmm. um, do, you have, do, you have, do you have any tech, taxonomies that are like, especially for that kind of environment? So call it, you know, banking and finance slash um, phone shop. Oh yeah. Uh, the answer <laughs> is, is, is uh, yeah. There's our, that's one of our sweet spots. The, uh, uh, we've got taxonomies for practically everything, but, uh, that happens to be one, and and the answer is yes. Okay, cool. 
Todd, you had a question. Of course. He ended right as I, I ate something. So, all right. So, you've been at this a while. You built this thing through at least two recessions. Yep. Major ones. Yep. Uh, we're kind of headed into that world. Uh, what what kept you alive in that in that space? What what made you survive where so many didn't? Well, I'm going to give you several answers, uh, uh, all of them true. But number one, the two most stubborn people on earth have to have been my mother and my father. My my my, my mother and, and I'm not when I I'm not exaggerating. My mother and father were were stubborn beyond belief. So I come by it honestly. Number number one. Number two, I from a financial standpoint, uh, I, I happen to have taken a company public uh, back in 1995. And so from a financial standpoint, uh, uh, I, 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 not that we have money coming out the ears, uh, but we've never ever wanted for money. Uh, uh, number two. Uh, number three. Uh, uh, there are a lot of mornings I would get up in the morning and say, what the hell am I doing? And then I would think about the value. I, I, I kept thinking about the gold uh, that was there. And I thought, you know, this is the right thing to do. I don't care how difficult uh, it is. So uh, from a financial standpoint, we've never lacked for money. Uh, from a, from a, a, a stubbornness standpoint, uh, uh, we uh, 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 have had a, a very stubborn leader uh, uh, from a standpoint of uh, uh, being interesting. I have to tell you that data warehouse was and still is interesting, uh, but, but doing text is actually eclipses data warehouse. I, I get up every day and learn something new every day of my life. And, and that, that's what keeps me going on. That's really cool. Um, so I'm trying to parse this question here that somebody typed. It's, uh... Huh, how to summarize this? I'll just read the whole thing. <laughs> okay, so uh, Alex asks, um, the discussion has brought up an interesting thought. Uh, as we have all uh, likely experienced communication uh, between employees in uh, different highly technical specialized fields can become muddled. Um, there would be a lot of value if documents written by the finance team could be more easily understood by the IT team. Um, could uh, the service of yours be used as a translation service of sorts? This is not the first time we've been asked that question. And, and I'm gonna give you kind of a hinky answer. The answer is sort of. We are not a translation product. There are other people that do that better than we do, and we don't do it. We do do some amount of translation, and can we be used for that? Let me tell you what it's like. It's like using a Porsche to pull your pigs to market in a truck. Can you put a, 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 a farm truck uh, uh, and hook it up to a Porsche and use your, your Porsche to pull it. Yeah, you can probably do that, but does that make a lot of sense? And, 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 and so there's a difference between the question of can you do it or should you do it? Can you use our product for translation? The answer is sort of, but it's not very good for that. Should it be used for translation? No, it shouldn't. We, we really don't recommend that. That's a good question. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Now, along that line, Joe, one, one thing, one thing that we can do that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, a while back, we did some documents from Canada. And in Canada, uh, the documents are in English and in French. And we don't have any problem in the world uh, reading and working on a document that's in both French and English. So we can handle multiple languages at the same time. But that's not the same thing as translation. Mm -hmm. Cool. So thanks. Awesome. Um, 
Bill, any any parting words of advice uh, for the audience, or any uh, parting words that, uh, in general? Well, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. We uh, 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 our experience with the venture capital community. Uh, we have shown in what we do uh, to uh, current to be about to eighty different venture capitalists, and not one venture capitalist has gotten what we do. And 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 we don't have any 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 financing. We 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 I've financed the whole thing, uh, but uh, I I think it's really kind of interesting. I I have, and maybe I shouldn't have this, but I have a very low opinion of venture capitalists. They uh, all venture capitalists are are people with a lot of money and a lot of arrogance, and that's and 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 I know that there's probably some venture capitalists out there uh, that. Uh, uh, don't fit that bill, but boy, the ones I've talked to, oh my, you try to say, look, guys, there's this wonderful opportunity, and it's a huge opportunity, and for whatever reason, this puts the venture capitalists to, to sleep. So anyway, that's just a, a final parting shot. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> so that's interesting. Well, you get you get successful to the point where you probably don't need them anyway. So I, I'll tell you, Joe, yeah. uh, uh, we're at that point right now. Uh, you, you know, one of the things I've heard from venture capitalists is, gee, Bill, what you need is $10 million in revenue. You need 10 referenceable customers, and you need, need to be profitable. At that point in time, we will consider an investment in you. And I say, great. At that point in time, I won't need an investment from you, you dolt. But, uh, 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 but, 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 but that's what I get from venture capital community. And guess what? We're just about at that point right now. And, and, and by this time next year, we'll be well beyond that point, and we will have done the whole thing without a penny in venture capital money. That's awesome. Well, Bill, uh, thanks for uh, you know, the great presentation and great, great conversation. I, I think it speak for the audience, and it's, a, it's an honor to have you here. So, so thanks a lot. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate talking with you. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Let me stop recording. Oh, and uh, also next uh, month, um, we'll be having uh, Chad Sanderson uh, as the guest of the show. So.